What is up, friends? Uh, this is my home, and uh, this is my YouTube channel. And thank you for, for joining me and hanging out with me. It is a real privilege to be able to sit and chat um, on my YouTube channel lately, on the lives and on these ones where me and Chase hang out and, uh, and shoot a bunch of stuff. I literally just ask people for questions and uh, I use them as a direction to go down rabbit holes and think out loud and explore ideas and see what we can learn about life and martial arts. I say life because I'm really into looking at something that's happening in a fight and then figuring out, is there an analogy to apply this to real life, to, to being a dad or a neighbor or my job or you know my business or whatever. And, and that route, I'm really into, and I'm going to be mining that route for weeks and months, maybe years, because to me, this there's a value in this beyond who's the greatest welterweight ever, whatever, right? And uh, so that's what we've been doing, and it's been a lot of fun. And I thank you for sending in your questions. My Instagram, my t um, X or Twitter, whatever that thing is, the, the comments in this section, um, please just leave questions as many as you want. I'm going to do multiple every day. Uh, every day? Every week. All right, let's get into it. Okay, at action underscore CEO. What's your favorite part of traveling the world with karate combat? Second question, but they should really go together. What's your favorite part of traveling the world with karate combat? Did you imagine being where you are today when you were younger? Did I imagine being where I am today when I was younger? I make this joke all the time. People are like, how's things? And I used to go live in the dream. People say that, people say that all the time, sometimes sarcastically, right? Uh, I am not living the dream because there is no way I would have ever dreamed that I would be, you know, married to my best friend, have a cute little uh, two and a half year old daughter, and get to literally live in a big ass house and travel around the world doing cool stuff. And all I do for a living or a business is talk about martial arts, explore martial arts. Never would I have dreamed when I was younger that that was going to be possible. Um, also, I, um, I have a partnership with Bruce Lee's family. And when I was a little kid, I was obsessed with Bruce Lee. And even as an adult, I've learned a lot about life through studying Bruce. If you told me that, that I was going to be doing a uh, digital partnership with Bruce Lee's family uh, when I grew up, Come on. First of all, I'd have been like, what's a digital partnership, right? There's, there was no such thing. But uh, so the world changes. You cannot anticipate your future. And it's great to have dreams, but uh, you can do, you, your life can be even better than you're capable of dreaming of. And I believe that's true. Maybe that'll be part of what we get into here. But let's look at the two parts of the question. What's your favorite part of traveling the world with karate combat? Did you imagine being at where you're at today when you were younger? So karate combat is one of my very prime. I have I don't have any bosses. Actually, I do have one boss. I'm working on a secret. Um, what would I call it? It's it's a series that will come out next year that is still a secret. Maybe I'll talk about it in a few months when I'm allowed to. Maybe I have a boss there. I don't know. Um, I've been working on it for about six months. But in all of my, I have partnerships. I have a partnership with karate combat. I do have people that direct and, and tell me where to go and, and, and stuff, but they're partnerships. Karate Combat, Jorge Masvidal's uh, Bare Knuckle, <laughs> Game Red Bare Knuckle MMA, uh, Levels Fight League in Amsterdam, Bruce Lee's family. I do some things for PFL and Bellator. I, these to me are, um, I have a great partnership with Betway, who is a gaming site, and I'm working on uh, a partnership with a energy drink. Right now that I've played, uh, done some things with, those, these are just, they're partnerships. And um, of them, Karate Combat is very much one of my primary ones because I love it, right? It's super fun. If you watch Karate Combat, you know, right? You look at this thing and you're like, this isn't some other, you know, some other show that's kind of like other shows, right? This isn't just the same thing. The language is different, the environment is different, the fighting surface is different, the rule structure is different, the combat is different, the art is different, the artists are different, it's all different. And different is beautiful, right? I am not gonna, I'm gonna resist my, my inclination to knock the mainstream. Although there's, I'm of a, of a chunk of 
people, there's a, there's a large chunk of people who don't like the mainstream. That's always been true, right? And we're not bad people. We're not, we get bothered by, we're not bad people. We don't, we're not too cool for school or whatever, but there's something about the thing that becomes, to make something appealing to everybody, you have to, you have to smooth off all the rough edges and you gotta make everything very, very reproducible. Lots, lots of systems and formulas and all of these things and that makes, for some people, things less interesting. And for me, I'm one of those people. So the most mainstream cage fighting, the most mainstream boxing, the most mainstream fighting to me is less interesting than these fascinating, well, I call them, and this is a bit cocky, maybe this is a, maybe this is too much of a compliment to the people who like these things, but I call them like connoisseur stuff, like, which probably is not a good word. Maybe something more like, like, um, Boutique stuff, that might be nicer. Cause it's not claiming like somehow I know more about wine or I know more about craft beer or I know more about cups or fighting. Kind of sort of sounds a, a little cocky. Let's not use that word anymore. Let's use the word boutique, right? Which sounds a little more like, well, that's where I get a cool candle. I go down, I don't go to Walmart to buy my candles. I go to the candle boutique. Um, but I like these, these fighting shows, these things where everything is a little different. Instead of the same rigid structure all the time and what's different is subtle bits of storytelling and subtle bits of how the fight plays out and little bits of how people talk about it, which is how the mainstream has to work, music and art and all things. Um, we end up being able to look at it so differently. Karate combat is so different. It's so creative. It's so, there are very few rules against innovation and creativity within our culture. And that goes for the fighters. That goes for how they express themselves. That goes for us. Karate combat is amazing. And what's your favorite part of traveling the world with it? My favorite part is, I don't know how different it's gonna be. We're at the time of shooting this, I'm getting on a plane tomorrow to travel to the next karate combat event. I don't know how different it will be. I don't know what even I will be uh, saying, seeing, experiencing, watching, enjoying, scared of. I don't know any of that stuff. And that's the beauty. If I go and I work for the, the most mainstream, you know, television cage fighting, I know that I will have a meeting at this time, then we'll be there, and then the rehearsal will happen, and then this thing, then I'm gonna say what's in the main event, and I'm gonna turn to the other guy, the co-main, oh, this amazing thing, knock over, like, we know what that's gonna look like. Karate combat, it's unwritten, and that is so cool. That's cool for the artists, the fighters, the, the martial artists, because it, they get to go in there and truly express themselves, and it's fascinating for us, and it's fascinating for the audience. Trust me, I've been doing this a long time, and I've never seen, I've never experienced the amount of fighters and coaches and parents of fighters and people who are reaching out to me saying, how can my fighter, how can I have, uh, fight for cardio combat? Never seen it like this. What that means is at the root, you know, not at the audience consumption level, but at the, the, you know, the inside the family level, this is, people are, super stoked about karate combat. So it's an exciting period. It's an exciting time to be doing it. And uh, I get to do my own thing I get to do is so fulfilling. I get to express myself as an artist around these martial artists and the art that they're creating. It's beautiful and I love it. And if you haven't been watching karate combat, then you're just not on top of the cutting edge. You're just not at the bleeding edge right now. And you will be because it's getting bigger all the time. Love it. This actually carries right onto it. It's by coincidence. I just grabbed these. I got um, dozens and dozens of questions. Thank you for your questions. Send more. Um, but this one happens to be right up against that one. Uh, this is from at Stuart Hillary. R what role do you think, if any, traditional karate kata play in today's combat sports? That's a really, really fun question. Because when I first saw it, I was like, traditional karate. You, you talk to somebody at ATT in Florida, and the conversation going on in the biggest gyms is karate is more, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing Dan Lambert, who uh, I work with sometimes on Jorge's um, uh, Game Bread Bare Knuckle. Um, Dan Lambert was like, I never thought I was gonna see the day when karate is a more important part of the puzzle for our fighters than wrestling. And I was like, dude, those are some, some big, that's a, that's a big statement, he's like, Talk to Mike Brown, talk to any of the coaches. He's like, the ability to move your feet in ways to stymie somebody who's coming at you, 
comes from karate. Rest, the concept of wrestling, although of course people move and se separate, eventually, conceptually, wrestling is about using your body to physically dominate another person. Not a lot of, is going to be going on running away from each other. That's just not an aspect of it. Of course, there are lots of times where I will try to evade you for whatever reason, fatigue, um, misdirection, uh, my own strategy, whatever. But essentially, wrestling takes place when our hands touch. And, and uh, that is an imperfect statement because as soon as we step onto the wrestling mat, we are wrestling. But what we think of as wrestling happens when I'm trying to touch you when I'm trying to grab you, when you're trying to grab me, engagement. Karate and the way that people are using the footwork concepts and the spacing concepts of karate uh, is about manipulating the gap. So manipulating the space between us. You try to grab me and I don't want to be grabbed or I want to move into a place where you're off balance and then hit you or whatever. So when I, that wasn't my statement. It was Dan Lambert's statement, digested, through the coaching, all of the coaches that he has hired to train all of the fighters at ATT. And you, you know, you can bring that statement to 20 other coaches, nine will agree, nine will disagree, and two will have some other an angle on it, but that is just factually true. It doesn't matter what you hear necessarily in a broadcast, because the broadcast doesn't tend to be up to the moment of what's actually happening in fighting. Um, when people are talking about leg kicks and broadcasts, by the t calf kicks, by the time that's actually a thing and the audience is like, blah, 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 calf kicks, the people in the gym are already three layers beyond that. That's always kind of how it's gone. But the question, so these are, these are my tangents and these are my rabbit holes, but the question was actually traditional karate kata. Now, a kata is a pattern of movements trained and reproduced. Uh, now, Anyone that's ever done karate, Taekwondo has a version, many martial arts have. I do um, Tai Chi recently as a, I started doing it when I had some very severe injuries. I did it for health, but I found many other benefits as a moving meditation as well. Uh, that is essentially all a kata, at least as far as I've got so far. It is the study of one, they call it the set in where I train, one long form of 108 moves put together or 80, I can't remember, 180, I believe. And, um, but in karate, we will have a kata where we move, we step, we turn, something happens, we do the next thing, and we kick, and it is a set of moves trained for a particular purpose. Now, when we're kids and we learn uh, kata in karate, we don't necessarily ask why we do it, but there's a million reasons we're doing it. It's strengthening our body. It's teaching us uh, the ability to learn. We're learning and then relearning and then tweaking and making small improvements within something as we go. We're moving up towards mastery, but we're also training our nervous system to do certain things. And I know I know the Karate Kid was a movie, but wax on, wax off, or whatever it was, paint the fence. Those were the, the theory, and it was brilliant in its own awesome way. The theory was through repetition, we will teach your body to do these things, and then your body will now have developed the ability to do them intuitively. That's actually real. When you train boxing, and, and, I'm, and I'm boxing, and my coach, I throw a jab or something, and my coach throws one and I slip and I counter with the right hand, and then I slip and I counter with the left hook, whatever it is, that's a kata. It's a Japanese word, but in boxing, you will call it something else, training a pattern, training reaction time, training a counter, that's all the same thing, right? Kata, um, in karate and in any of these environments, people look at that and think it's nonsense, but it's very much not nonsense. And uh, doing one that's wildly all over the floor into this thing and then into this and the high kick and the step and uh, like, it may not be something you use in fighting, but when you are training, jab, slip, counter, slip, hook, step, right hand, that's a kata, right? So people who don't, people who don't study these things, but repeat what they've heard in places like a broadcast or a, or at certain um, places on it, the internet where the purpose of something is to entertain you or to sell you something or to create excitement or whatever it is, um, you may miss the fact that kata is a part of training of every martial art, every fighter, every single fighter that you watch, Alex Pereira, 
does some version of the same concept of what we call a kata in karate. Um, he trains things. That left hook of his was trained through the same, through the same um, systems and processes processes that kids use when they're doing a kata and karate. So, so when you rethink what it means to do the kata across the floor and then take micro moments of that, that is how you train to fight. Fighting happens so quickly that it cannot be done with conscious thought. In the time it takes to slip, punch, slip, punch, move, block, kick, whatever, those things happen faster than words. So you cannot think in words. So when you see something, you go, I saw this thing and now I better do this. You've already been hit or you've already lost the window. It has to happen faster than words. So essentially, almost all fighting that is happening instantaneously in conflict with another person has to be uh, automated. You, you, all fighting is little micro moments of automation. You, you do not see a punch coming. Think about, oh, there's a punch. I better slip and put my weight into my, into my hip and then punch back. That cannot be done because the time it takes to think it is longer than the time it takes to do it. So you cannot think that. So you automate that. Almost all fighting that you see is automated or, or moments of automation strung together using bits and pieces, fragments of conscious thought and they, the, the pulling in of information as you have it and applying it now to allow yourself to, to express the automated movements again. That's fighting. That's how it happens. And uh, because of that, you train that type of automation through the same subsystems that a kid trains a kata in karate. And it's awesome. It's so cool. And we'll look more deeply into this in the coming weeks. Okay, more. At Ferrante Worldwide. That's Todd Ferrante. He is one of the producers of Karate Combat. Sometimes I get to have him in my ear. He's a dear friend and a brother, and I love working on uh, Karate Combat with him. At Ferrante Worldwide. Why can't people accept Jake Paul is a real fighter? I love this question. First of all, there are two parts of this question if we look at it right. Is Jake Paul a quote, real fighter? And then if so, why can people not accept that? So is Jake Paul a real fighter? I mean, clearly he's really fighting. Uh, clearly he's main eventing large events. When I look as a martial arts analyst, as, a, as somebody who's dedicated his life to analyzing combat, he's a very good fighter. He's a very, very skilled fighter and he's getting better so quickly. He's evolving so unbelievably quickly. Um, this is the part people don't like, but it's true. Jake Paul, it, it, he's like nine and one or 10 and one. He's doing exactly what every single good uh, boxing prospect does. And he's fighting sort of not the hardest level fights yet. If you're somebody who actually has the capacity to earn money or the, 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 is projected to be a very high quality fighter, you don't fight a real fight until you're like 18 and all. Not a single one of these kids does that. And for some reason, people want to hold that against Jake Paul. He's actually fought way tougher boxing matches than 90% of fighters until fight number 17, 18, 19, 20. Good fighters, high, real prospects that people are, are I don't, this is not a good or a bad thing. Uh, it's certainly not, it's just what it is. In boxing, if you have a prospect, who has the, 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 the probability or possibility of being world championship material. He fights low level or she fights low level fights all the way till 17, 18, 19, 20 and all. That's always the case. All of them. Jake Paul's actually fought Anderson Silva and Tyron Woodley and Mike Perry. Way harder fights than every fighter who, uh, and I mean almost every fighter who is you know, being brought along as a prospect to make other people rich. Jake Paul's making himself rich, which is great to see uh, because a lot of these young fighters end up being brought along and somebody else gets rich and they don't. So this is all normal. Um, 
And then, yeah, he lost to a pretty good fighter on a, on a pretty bad day. And that's important. Losses are very, very important. Uh, and he's looked much better since then. Jake Paul's very much a real fighter, right? Jake Paul is very much a real fighter. So the second question is, why can't people see that? Um, he's also a provocateur, right? He is very, very good at making you dislike him. Uh, he is, he's mastered that skill. And by making you dislike him, you will then create a lot of engagement for him. And here's another secret. He doesn't need to sell pay-per-views. He makes hundreds of that, sorry. He makes millions of dollars a week on all of his platforms. Never mind this W thing. Millions and millions of dollars a week. The boxing is something he does obviously because he loves it. Uh, Rich people don't become professional boxers. Super rich, successful people don't become professional boxers. They make bad hip hop albums, right? That's what they do. This guy goes and puts himself into a situation where he's gonna get punched in the face by you know, Mike Tyson or uh, Tyron Woodley or whatever. He doesn't need to do any of this. He doesn't need the money. He doesn't need the attention. He does it because he loves boxing, clearly. This is what he wants to do. A lot of easier ways to go take a, be a super rich guy and, and go off into something else. He does it because he loves it. He's a really good boxer. He's a really good fighter. He's a really smart businessman, but most of all, he's really good at making you hate him. And if you hate him, you'll look for every reason to say this isn't good. But the one that doesn't make any sense is saying, you know, the, the competition level. He's fighting tougher competition than 17 out of 20, 10 in one fighters ever fight. Um, you know? If he makes you hate him, and he makes you engage with him, and he makes you, um, you know, leave angry things, he makes money off you, and he's trying to he's trying to milk your anger for money. Um, but he's a really good, really good uh, fighter who doesn't need to fight for any reason other than obviously he loves it and wants to do it, which is what makes him quite dangerous and quite good, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, it'll be fascinating to see where he goes. How old is this dude, by the way? Uh, 27. Wow. It's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good for this age. So it will be a very interesting thing. Can he beat Canelo in four years? Probably not, right? But is he going to make a lot of money, provoke a lot of people, have incredible experiences that most people would never dare to have? Yeah, he's going to do those things. And that's something, that's something to admire. All right, let's move on. At Jits Junkie. Was there a specific fight you remember watching that made you want to make martial arts a way of life? He goes on to reference even a fictional fight on TV or movies or actual boxing or MMA. When I was a kid, I could not stop watching. First, it was Jean-Claude Van Damme and Chuck Norris because that was the low-hanging fruit when I was a kid. But the second I discovered Bruce Lee movies, that was all I wanted to do. And I was... I was uh, sure that I just like that that was the moment I had discovered what I was going to be most interested in for the rest of my life. Now I was a gymnast and I was a very and I was like a you know at nine and ten doing flips and lay layout flips and and I was a high diver too so I did one and three meter uh, diving and platform diving but suddenly I saw what what I was really interested in as far as movement. I was super into moving and and tumbling and stuff, but then I really saw it. I saw Bruce Lee and the whole thing just made sense to me. I could have never projected how it would play out, but I knew that martial arts, I wanted it to be a part of my life. And then when I was a little kid, I bugged my parents about it like crazy. Like I just, I wanna do this, I wanna, I wanna go train and I wanna, and they'll tell the story that they're like, you know, Robin was a, a hyperactive, weird kid, didn't seem all that focused, didn't seem to really, I was pretty good in school, like I learned well. My dad, uh, my parents are very intelligent people and so there's some genetic intelligence, but like when I was focused on something that I liked, I would do well at it, but then certain other things I just had no interest and they were like, you know, he seems to really want this. And I think they did the thing that some parents do uh, which is like, if they keep talking about it, maybe they'll forget about this in a few weeks or it'll go away. But if they keep talking about it and they keep asking, it's real. And eventually they would drive me, I lived in a small town called Pinawa, Manitoba. It's almost two hours away. And they would drive me in uh, three times, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, right after school and I would train, I'd get in and warm up 
I got in early and I liked to stretch and I was, you know, doing the splits. And when you were a kid then, it was Jean-Claude Van Damme and stuff. So he wanted to kick straight up in the air, which I could do a side kick straight up uh, as a kid. And uh, yeah, I would stretch and prepare and do my own thing for 30, 40 minutes and then do two full hour classes. My mom would just sit in the car or in the, the waiting area, but more often she liked the car and, or my dad. My mom ended up doing it more because of work. And yeah, they did that for years for me and I never became less interested. It made me a better diver and a better gymnast and better at almost every sport that, you know, anything physical that I did and I learned better and I was obsessed. And so I trained and I competed and, and um, when I was 18 or going on 18, I was trying to find, it was Taekwondo that I, that I had found and that I had access to as a kid. And I started my own school. I taught kids uh, once I was a black belt. And then I um, started to try to look for colleges that had some type of Taekwondo team in America or all of them. My dad uh, is an educator and he had a book of what they have. And, and I couldn't find anything. And I studied human movement, a bit of kinesiology. One year I dropped out because I never went to school because I didn't like it. I liked doing martial arts. But uh, the, um, yeah, the second I saw it, and, and not everybody will, will have this. Not every kid will have this. I hope, I hope it's very obvious what my daughter is really into. If it's art or science or astronomy or like dance or whatever. I hope it's as evident as it was for me, but yeah, it was, it was pretty evident. There's a period of my life where in my sort of from my twenties till about 36, early twenties, where I really was into being a singer in a rock band. And although that was a wonderful experience and there are things from that that I use as far as writing today, the poetry of it, um, the performance of it, the way I express myself at karate combat, there are elements of it, but that was kind of the dark period where I wasn't learning as much and I wasn't growing as much because martial arts really wasn't a big part of my life. And the second I began training jujitsu in my thirties and then Muay Thai and then back to all kinds of martial arts, that was probably 35, 36, I'm almost 55 now. Uh, then that became, the, I was refocused and I was able to, this is my whole life. Everything that I have, everything good in my life is a direct result of the study of martial arts. Everything. Uh, this, this business that I've created that I love and, uh, you know, gives my family a great life all directly relates back to the study of martial arts and fighting. I had nine pro fights and those fights allowed me to do what I do now. There are people who do not train who do various things in the world of martial arts. I always find that strange um, because, and I get it, some people are just afraid, like, you know, and fear is okay, fear is real, it's part of life. They're just afraid, but anyone at any age can go into a jiu-jitsu gym or a karate gym or ask, uh, do a private boxing lesson and study some amount of martial arts. Um, it's a great, it changed my life. Everything I have, like I said, is a direct result of those Bruce Lee movies I watched as a kid. And I'm very, very thankful. And I mentioned it already in this show, but um, uh, I have a partnership with Bruce Lee's family now, which is so wild, which is so wild to me. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, I hope I live for 30, 40 more years and I get to see what else the study of martial arts can reveal. All right, uh, one more, and uh, we have gotten in the habit of ending on something positive every time, which is, I really love that, but it's also like, mm, this whole vibe has been positive for the last couple of months, and we're gonna keep that. And it's not like sadness or pain or any of these things are not an important part of life, they are. You know, positivity can be, you know, weird too. Like, it's okay to feel fear and anxiety and worry and sadness, like these are part of life too. Uh, but something about this vibe of getting to hang out and do this, I tend to feel pretty positive anyways. But I thought something about this one would, would take me to somewhere positive. Uh, at Bannock Chef, are you thinking about getting another puppy? Right? Um, so I had a, a dog for 18 years and uh, he died a couple months before my um, daughter was born. And I always look, looked at it and it was like this, and he was such a great little man. And uh, you can love your animals so much more than people realize. But, uh, and 
I always looked at him and was like, right down to the end, this guy had it, like figured out. He was like, he looked around and he kind of, everything was changing. We're getting new stuff and cribs and my wife was, you know, and he was looking at me, he's like, something else going on here and I don't think you need me to be a burden, you know? And he just, he just, it was, he was old, like he was old. There's something beautiful about having an old pet. There's just something so, so special about having a senior pet, you know, and you start to like take, you love like taking care of them, this, and you love like helping them. And um, the, uh, yeah, and then, you know, he was very old and he slept a lot and he cuddled a lot. And then there was about three really rough days and one really rough day. And then you took him in there like, we could try to give you a few more days. And I was like, is he gonna be in pain if we try to do that? And they're like, yeah, you know. And they, the vet didn't want to say, um, you know, this is it. He wants you to make the decision, but he's gonna give you all the information. He's a great vet, this, this guy. Um, he's like a cartoon vet. And uh, he's gonna give you all the information to let you make the best decision, which was don't put this guy through anything. Let, it, let today be his last date. And, um, but uh, so for anyone who has uh, pets, people ask, we'll, we'll say this all the time, having, they don't want to insult anyone with kids, but they'll tell you having a pet, it's very much like having a kid. And you, you're careful when you say that around people with kids who don't have pets. But then if you have both, you realize, yeah, no, a pet very actually is much more similar than people think. It's much more similar uh, in what, how you need to take care of them, how you care about them. They're family, they really are. My daughter, I do love, and will always love my daughter more than I love my dog, but I loved my dog, you know? Uh, so it's a really good question. Um, and I will definitely get another puppy, but I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. And uh, like I said, I like to end these things positively. And I think there's something positive about this thought. It's like sadness is actually a really important part of your life. The goal of life isn't, happiness isn't a destination. Like we do all these things, we'll end up happy. Happiness is a path. Happiness is, and on that path, you can't be happy unless you know what it's like to hurt. You can't, there's like this idea of the bittersweet. You can't really truly be happy without experiencing a little pain. You can't have a wonderful day without having a bad day. They don't have context. Winning, winning a fight, part of what makes it so, or winning in, in any type of thing, part of what makes it so beautiful is that losing is really painful. Right? But to be a real, real complete person with a complete life, you don't want to run away from sadness. Your pup, your, the, the, your pet will die, right? Your, your parents will die, right? This is a part of life. And finding happiness, really being happy, is to understand that that's a part of life experience those feelings, really live them, and then come out the other side thankful for everything that you have. And I was very lucky, right? I was very lucky. Like, you know, I think four weeks later, my daughter was born, right? Like how much, how could you, of course I was sad and I'm still sad. It's been two and a half years. I'm still sad. My little man is gone. Um, but could you see anything more beautiful than that, than to experience that sadness so that the moment that she was born, uh, you could really experience joy and have context for it, you know? And that's where sadness and pain and worry and, and you know, all of these things, being down, these are part of life. And so what made me think of that when I said I wanna leave on something positive is positivity isn't some crazy weird thing. It's not a cult, right? Happiness isn't a cult. Being you know, uh, motivated and finding inspiration in art and music and, and fighting and these things. It isn't weird and cult-like and, and hiding from the world. You experience things, you know? It's okay to experience things. It's a part of life. Life is beautiful. Life is beautiful because all of these things are in it. Thank you for hanging with me today. I'm gonna end there. Uh, it just feels right. 
But thank you for hanging with me today. And thank you to everybody who watches the lives. I try to go live Thursday evenings, uh, every Thursday evening. And I don't always, but, but often I have been. And it's been really fun. And uh, thanks for hanging with me. If you hung with me th from beginning to end on any of these, leave me a comment at, at the bottom that says beginning to end and give me a question. And uh, I'm very thankful, very grateful. Much love. Enjoy the hostilities, my friends.